Chapter 121 Lao stepped in first, and the others soon followed. The interior of the city hall was strangely bare, but there was the potential for so much more. There was no furnishing, save for a few austere-looking desks and tables, but the place was built with a grand idea in mind, with vast hallways and large staircases. There were three floors to the building, and the bottom floor was dominated by a meeting hall, with what looked like thousands of chairs inside it. It looked far larger than the building was on the outside, and it seemed that some spatial magic was a play here. Jeffrey? What's going on here? Sam asked. He knew what was going on, but he wanted some clarification. If you buy things from the system, it will implement changes to them to make it fit into the grand scheme of a city. It had to match the number of seats to the number of members in the faction, but it did so in a way that it did not take up too much space. Huh. So by the system, do you mean the thing that gives us the stat sheets, or the creature that is in control of our universe? What was it called? Oh yeah, the system overseer. No, a system overseer is, um, the best analogy would be an admin on an online site. They manage the working of the system, but they are not the system itself. Sam nodded, and then realized that this seemed like it could be the answer to why the system overseer had not discovered his quest, despite it being given by the system. Okay. Just be clear, do the overseers have full purview over the system? Jeffrey shrugged and shook his head. I have no idea. Things like that are not something that people like us would know. Perhaps the Creator Kings would, but nobody below them. Who are the Creator Kings? Almost everyone, save for Sam, said in unison. Jeffrey sighed. It seemed that a lot of talking was in order. I'm starting to get tired of being a personal encyclopedia of the system, but whatever. Come with me, and I will give you a full rundown of multiversal history. You too Sam, this is something that I don't think you know. The others all followed Jeffrey, but Rax peeled off the group a few minutes later, smelling something interesting. They entered a room to the side of the hallway, a small office that was perfect for such things. Jeffrey walked around the room, looking for something, and when he found a small box connected to what looked like a projector with a wire, he smiled. Ah, there's one of these. Good. Now, I am not a professional historian, so this will be an extremely bastardized version of the true history, but I will tell you the basics. Jeffrey turned around and Sam could faintly hear him whisper something that sounded suspiciously like at least all of that wasted time in school is paying off. Jeffrey placed his hand on the box, and an image appeared on the screen. It was of a not unpleasant looking alien, laying on a bed in a state of undress. Eduardo cleared his throat, and Jeffrey turned bright red. Shit. Sorry about that, these kinds of projectors display the thoughts of those using them. I was, ahem, having a moment there. The display changed to a picture of utter darkness. In the time before time, the primal darkness of the void, there was nothing. Then a spark of creation appeared amidst the yawning abyss. A small mote of light blossomed in the darkness, and exploded outwards in a storm of raw power. Sam made a face, and Jeffrey scowled. Okay, fine, this is not how I would normally talk. It's just that I remember a lecture on this subject, and I am trying to channel my instructor. Oh, no. It's better this way, it was just surprising, that's all, Sam explained. Jeffrey laughed and continued to speak. Suddenly, there was light. Out of the infinite abyss, there was suddenly matter. Nothing could be discerned at that point, but over the next few nanoseconds, two entities emerged. The Tao and the System. The Tao was a force of chaos, a creature that encapsulated everything that ever is, was, or will ever be. The system was a being of pure order, the polar opposite of the Tao. Such forces could never coexist, and the boundless expanse was created through their struggles. Their influence was since weakened, and nobody has seen the true power of either entity since then. The only reason that we even know this much is because of the system providing us with that information. However, the system eventually prevailed over the Tao, and that force was subsumed into the system, turned into one of the most important parts of it. Through the Tao, cultivators can touch on the esoteric concepts of the universe, and thus gain great power. 
The image on the projector changed again, this time showing a large array of identical spheres that all glowed with the colors of the rainbow. As the nascent expanse of existence came into being, the Tao got to work, seeding new universes and multiverses with the templates of its nature. Thus the Tao annals were created. George raised his hand to speak, but Geoffrey ignored him. The large man pouted and lowered his hand. The further away from the center of creation that a discrete dimensional space was, the more slowly it developed. That is why the multiverse that we are in is considered weak, by other multiverses further up the boundless expanse. That is technically just a rumor, as out of multiverse contact is vanishingly rare, but it is most likely true. Anyway, this is all ancient history, so I suppose that I should get on to the relevant stuff. An image of a man standing on the prow of a pure white ship, sailing through the darkness of the void, appeared on the screen. When our multiverse was first explored, it was by a race of highly advanced psionics, led by a man called Altari. They took to the astral plane in boats wrought out of their own power and exotic elements, and there they found the system. They took to it like a fish to water, and soon they had made contact with other universes. First came the Nelvani, then the Fushani, and then the Terravarians. As the multiverse grew, the first of the gods emerged, who was none other than Altari. More and more factions grew out of the fertile fields of the untapped astral plane, and thus began the period known as the Age of Myth. Legends rose and fell, godlike entities were slain by true gods, and the first maps of the multiverse were made. A picture of a crudely drawn map appeared that looked almost like a cave painting, so old was it. This is one of the ancient relics of the Age of Myth, the first map of the multiverse. It is one of the many disseminated pieces of information that the system likes to throw to people, like us, on the edge of the multiverse, like coins to a pauper. Not that there is any coinage system in use anymore. Jeffrey took on a wistful look, and then shook his head. Anyway. As the various races began to explore the multiverse, the age of myth vanished into the deep past, and a new age of enlightenment and discovery began. The Age of Exploration the projector screen shifted to an image of a vast city floating in the void, filled with billions of cartographers, furiously mapping out something. The worldship of Chronic Farn was one of the chief agents of this new change. It was not a powerful military group, but it had many allies, chief among them Altari. By then, Altari had his eyes set on the title of Multiversal King, and he needed maps for this. Chronic Varn was the greatest source of information in the known multiverse then, but it has since been lost to the ages, and with it invaluable stockpiles of research. The projector shifted yet again, this time to images of demagogues addressing armies that numbered in the tens of trillions of soldiers. Not all was peaceful however, and murmurs of discontent started to ring across the multiverse. The races of the multiverse were becoming restless, and there was no leader. Without a ruler, the multiverse was nothing more than a state of anarchy. These massive armies clashed on the outskirts of universes, around places of great cosmic import, and even in the void itself. Reality tore as the most powerful of beings surfaced and they wrought havoc through their actions. Multiple universes were consigned to an eternity of nothingness by the backlash of the conflict between the Daos of higher-level cultivators and the interiors of universes were devastated by the conflict of untold numbers of soldiers. Pictures of the burnt-out husks of planets and strange exotic clumps of matter that were the remnants of universes flashed by on the screen. Over time, the damage accumulated to a point that was untenable, and all of the multiverse was in danger from the conflict. The strongest factions started to band together into conglomerations of allied kingdoms, until eventually the clumping reached the point where all of the forces in the multiverse were split between two different factions, each espousing different aspects of the Tao. The Creator Kings and the Lords of Destruction The Creator Kings were led by Altari, and the Lords by a powerful demonic hybrid named Zothrak, the Scourge. In one final apocalyptic battle, the two factions determined the future of the multiverse. Almost half of the multiverse was leveled by this clash, and out of the morass of particles floating in the cosmic sea, Altari emerged victorious. Using his newfound power as the strongest being in the multiverse, he rebuilt the shattered multiverse from scratch, with the help of his 98 strongest companions. 
Thus Altari gained his title of Altari, the progenitor. An image of Altari, striding out of a warped region of space and creating a new universe flashed by, and then pictures of the other creator kings showed up, all of them aiding him in his venture. The defeat of his greatest rival was enough to allow Altari to reach the pinnacle of a rank, where he remains to this day. As the conflict cooled, and order was restored to reality, a new peace was formed, one wrought of fear of the creator kings. The final, and current, age began, the age of expansion. The multiverse endlessly integrates new universes, in a cycle of consumption like no other. More and more are found every year, and the rate is only speeding up. The screen went black, and everyone started clapping as they realized that the speech was over. Jeffrey took a bow and left the projector, returning to the group. Now that you are all sufficiently educated, why don't we get to work? Jeffrey said, looking a bit peeved. Sure, Sam said, noting that Jeffrey was a bit annoyed at having to explain all of that stuff to them. Sam could have just bought some information crystals about the subject, or surfed the interweb, but there was something about having a living person talk to you that made the information stick. Chapter 122 They moved in one group through the city hall, exploring it and making mental maps of the structure. The second floor was a series of office cubicles, and the third floor seemed to be some sort of military planning room, and it was connected to the defense part of the Metropolis Corps. As Sam had made the city hall over where the Corps had been, it now was situated in the center of the meeting room on the first floor, right where he could have access to it. There was an interactive map of the area that showed the positions of the faction's members as blinking green dots. There were a few red dots as well that told Sam that there were a few monsters hiding in the woods around the city hall. None of that information was especially pertinent right now, but in the event of an invasion, which would likely be coming soon if the engines of the end times quest was to be believed, then it would be invaluable. This had been possibly the best purchase that Sam could have made. As he looked around the room further, he saw something interesting. There was an arch of silvery metal, with a button next to it. There were words written on a plaque next to it, and Sam moved over to read them. Emergency Portal This device gains one charge per 24-hour period, up to a maximum of three charges. When used, one being will be teleported a random distance, between 100 and 1,000 miles, in a way that does not pose any risk to them. Charges 0-3 It was basically an escape route for the most important people in the faction. Its very existence annoyed Sam, as it would mean that only three people could escape if the unthinkable happened and the compound was overrun. As the others filed over, they read the description too, and the faces of those who understood the implications fell. If that ever has to be used, you will have to be the first out, Sam. You are the most important person here, and without you this faction is meaningless, Lao said, his face grave. No, that will not happen. I am the most powerful person here, by a long shot, and I should stay behind to defend the people here if we are invaded. Sam's face was grim, and it was clear to the others that he would not brook any argument on the subject. Both Sam and his Dao were in agreement. Fleeing when one was in a position to help others was not a virtuous thing to do. The others grimaced, but they did not argue. Sam was the faction leader after all. His word around here was law. He could remove them from the faction at any time, not that he would, and that was the most effective deterrent of any misbehavior. All of them knew that Sam would never do that, unless there was a real reason for it, but it was best not to test him. They left the war room, and walked down the stairs, towards the exit. As they left the city hall, Sam looked back up at it. Seeing the new building, something that symbolized everything that they stood for, was quite inspiring. It was a testament to their resolve, and a monument to their enduring success. Sam briefly wondered what the other factions were getting up to as he took in the sight. He doubted that they were doing as well as he was. In the Grand Canyon Over the last day, a small city had started to form on the base of the Grand Canyon. The overlord had watched as his minions built the buildings out of the rock, saving all of their credits for himself. He had forced everyone who had chosen to side with him to entrust their money to him, in exchange for his protection. 
In addition, each one of them had signed binding contracts that they would forfeit half of their future earnings to him. It did not make for a happy populace, but they were too afraid of the overlord to protest. He had already made an example out of someone who had defied him. Watching a person die from aura pressure alone was not a pretty sight. The detritus had been ingrained into the walls of the canyon by the explosive demise of the unfortunate soul. The overlord had picked this site well, as there was nowhere to go for hundreds of miles in each direction, perhaps even more accounting for the expansion of the planet. The wastelands that surrounded the canyon were filled with hordes of monsters and even worse, no resources on which to live. The people were stuck between a rock and a hard place, or rather, the overlord and their circumstances. It was better to remain in relative safety than to surrender to the hungry unknown. Nobody there, save for the weakest of mages, were even feeling any hunger, on account of their enhanced bodies. As a result, the overlord had tentatively agreed to set up a farming system, if only out of necessity. What he had splurged on was defenses for the compound. There were multiple layers of walls and weapons emplacements surrounding the city now. The small size of the compound made it so that the density of weaponry was far higher than it would have been normally. In the ruins of New York, Rodney Kane had decided to go for size over defenses, and their faction headquarters filled up almost a quarter of the whole city. It had led to there being a low density of defenses, but there were few monsters within the ruins of New York, as opposed to other places. Rodney had been demoralized by his failure within the tournament. He had expected that he would lose to the Overlord, but not to Sam. Sam had gained power far more quickly than he should have, and Rodney still fumed about that frequently. Andrew Monroe was still hanging around him, but more because of the fact that he did not possess a faction, than out of any loyalty. Andrew was now no more Rodney's ally than he was Sam's, or the Overlord's ally. He was his own man, caught between sanity and the overtures of his AI controller. The AI was not capable of conceptualizing the fact that it was not completely in control, and thus it did not do anything about it. As the rest of the people of Earth started to come back from stasis, Andrew would leave and set up his own kingdom. To hell with factions and the system, he would do it his own way. Rodney was oblivious to this, and he was instead filling his time by playing around with the construction options of his settlement interface. Playing God comforted him, and thus far his credits had gone a long way. In the midst of the post-apocalyptic rubble of New York, a paradise was rising out of the dust, a city of hopes and dreams, and also of corruption and deceit. There were no laws in Kane City, save for that of the strong. The only commonality between the three burgeoning factions was that the looming threat of the next stage of the initialization hung over them like a shadow over the sun. The Engines of the End Times Quest Chapter 123 At the Dao Tree Sam sat in a meditative position underneath the boughs of the Dao Tree. There were only a few other people with him, as more would have diluted the power of the tree, but they were making good use of it. Sam, Eduardo, Lau, and Jeffrey were clustered around it, so far the only people to have formed a Dao in the entire faction. Well, Jeffrey had not formed one per se, but he still had one. In addition to this, Sam had remembered the Dao fruit that he had left with Jeffrey, the one that only worked up to F rank. It was hard to believe, but he was getting close to the next rank, and he would be able to progress even more quickly now that he was out of the tournament. He had talked to Jeffrey about what the best thing to do with it would be, and the alien had told him that he was better off just selling it. A mere G rank Dao fruit would be worthless to somebody who had a fragment stage Dao, but there would be many people who would pay good money for one. With that in mind, Sam had set up a stall on the interweb, for the price of 10,000 credits, and had displayed his fruit there. He wasn't very clear on how this would all work, but apparently the system would teleport the item, in exchange for a small fee, to its buyer once purchased. He had put it up for 5 million credits, something that seemed like far too much to him, but what Jeffrey told him was nothing to the various hereditary sects of the multiverse who would pay anything for their progeny to gain an edge. When it was bought, he was planning to put the money into the faction funds. Sam had discovered that the purpose of the faction coffers was to prevent corruption by making it so that any money put in there could only be used for construction. 
That was where he was planning to send all the taxes, too, once he had set the taxation system up. He was going to wait until after the end of the initialization for that, instead relying on the voluntary contributions of the members until then. As he sat in the tranquil shade of the tree, small flashes of insight whirled around him like autumn leaves in a gale. They were all unconnected to each other, some about his current Tao, and some about possible ones. He knew that he would have to start accumulating Tao soon in order to follow his path properly, but for now he wanted to focus on gaining as much power as he could, which revolved around upgrading his fragment. And then, there was the question of his meridian, which also needed to be cultivated. For now though, he let his concerns drift away on the winds of his insights, instead trying to glean that little bit of information that stood between him and increasing his comprehension of his Tao. It seemed that quite a lot of time in the future would be spent pondering his Tao, rather than fighting. Sam shook his head and cleared his mind, drifting away from reality for some time. A flash of light brought him out of his state, and he bolted up, noting that the light had come from near the wall. Something was attacking their compound. He ran as fast as he could, leaving the others, save Eduardo, in the dust. The other man could keep pace with Sam, but only barely, and that was because he had predominantly focused on dexterity. By the time that they had reached the wall, Sam could make out what was going on. An utterly massive version of the dire bears that he had fought before loomed over the wall, roaring in rage as the defenders shot arrows and spells up at it. None of them did more than scratch the surface of its skin however. Sam quickly scanned it and gritted his teeth as he saw what it was. Mature Dire Bear Level 49 It was the adult version of the juvenile Dire Bears, and it was on the cusp of F rank. It was more than ten levels higher than Sam, and its natural power would make that gap even larger. Luckily, they had the advantage of numbers on their side, or else this might not have been a winnable battle. The bear opened its maw wide, and a beach ball-sized ball of blood ripped through one of the defenders, moving so quickly that it was almost solid. Sam growled and jumped up the wall, gripping onto small handholds along the way. He reached the top just in time to see another defender die, and he roared as the power of his Tao started to fill him. The bear turned to look at him, just in time to see Sam's mace impact its skull. The bear folded under the strike, crashing back onto all fours. It shook its head in pain as a small trickle of blood dripped down, but it was otherwise unhurt. Its prehensile tail whipped up and grabbed Sam's ankle, pulling him towards it. Sam grabbed onto the battlements, thankful for the medieval construction of the wall, and heard the rock begin to crack as he was pulled in. A strip of white light sped up towards him and cut the tail in half, letting Sam scramble away. The bear screamed, a noise that had everyone covering their now bleeding ears, and went berserk. It was too weak to break the wall easily, but it was causing cracks to run up it with each smash of its massive paws. Sam rolled to his feet and started to imbue himself with his body enhancement technique. As he did so, something clicked within him and he received a notification. He had finally mastered the technique enough for it to become a skill. However, he did not have time to look at that now, and all he felt was that it had become far easier for him to use. Sam propelled himself through the air by his bones, gathering up power that he started to channel into the beginning of his final attack. It would not really work on the bear, as it was too large, but it would at least do some damage. His mace whipped up from his waist as he jumped off the wall, sending the bear up onto its back legs as it connected. Pushing off the wall, Sam cocked back his mace and walloped the bear's stomach with it. The creature retched and vomited up a stream of blood and bile right on top of him. Sam groaned and rolled underneath the bear, knocking it over with a sweep of his mace. Jumping up to deliver the final blow, he brought his mace down with all of his strength on the bear's stomach. The explosive energy of his Tao detonated as he made contact, and the bear was blasted into the ground by the explosion. A large wound was torn into its stomach, and it roared. Sam jumped back as it swiped it where he had been, still unnaturally lively, despite the wounds that it had taken. Three short blades of wind shot out from its paws as it swiped, and caught Sam unawares. His left cheek was carved deep, and he swore as he remembered that he had just finished healing the wound there, from fighting the overlord. Now it was reopened. 
Interestingly enough, the attacks had glanced off his teeth, the bony protuberances apparently much more durable than his skin. His entire jaw ached from the impact, but at least he hadn't lost any teeth. Instead, he just looked like a man who had narrowly survived a knife fight. The bear got to its feet, limping slightly, and charged Sam. He ducked to the side as one of its massive paws crashed down where he was, and he spun his mace around towards it. Without the aid of his finisher, which had most certainly not worked as advertised, the bear only stumbled as he struck it. It wheeled around and crashed down on Sam, using its bulk as a weapon. Sam groaned as his bones were crushed beneath the bear, and it took all the strength he had to keep it off him enough to breathe. Then a bolt of blue energy soared down from the walls and struck the bear's head. Immediately, it rolled off of Sam, suddenly under the effect of its own attack. The weight that it had leveraged against Sam was now pressing down on itself. The force of gravity on the bear was now effectively doubled, and it labored to its feet a moment later. Sam smiled and struck the bear multiple times in the span of a second, waiting for his mana and Dao energy to recover enough for him to use justice is best served cold again. The skill name was ridiculous, but it had an undeniable ring to it, one that made Sam smile. The bear tried to swipe at him again, but a series of throwing knives slammed into the paw, causing the bear to withdraw it. Sam looked up behind him and saw Claude drawing a seemingly endless supply of knives out of somewhere and throwing them. The two sisters had both drawn bows and were in the process of loading them. Finally, George had drawn his greatsword and was vaulting over the edge of the battlement. He landed on the bear's back a moment later and he smashed the weapon into its spine. Such a heavy weapon going at such high speeds acted more like a club than anything else and Sam smiled as he heard a vertebrae break. George rolled off the bear's back and landed next to it. It tried to crush him beneath its paw, but its motor control was suddenly gone, and all it did was flail around. Sam rushed in with his mace and smashed the bear's head to the side, breaking teeth and nearly dislocating its jaw. Three more strikes to the same place ended up breaking the bone entirely, and the bear whimpered as it reared back at the sudden pain. George stabbed the bear in the belly with the end of his sword, landing right on the wound that Sam had already created. His sword slid in deep, and the bear let out one last pitiful groan and then collapsed to the ground, dead. Sam winced as the adrenaline from the fight left his body, and his cheek blazed as if it had been lit on fire. You have killed a mature dire bear. You have leveled up. Chapter 124 The essence had been split between them all as they had all had a hand in dealing damage. The essence conversion was worse than if they had all been in a party together, but Sam did not fully trust the new captains yet. Claude was the one who seemed the least trustworthy. George seemed too innocent to betray him, and the two sisters looked to be honorable enough. If he had his way, Claude would have been replaced with Okita, but Lau had told him that it would be a bad idea to have a man who would eventually be responsible for the faction's finances to be in such a position of power. As Sam cleaned himself off, he realized something important. There was no way to get back up onto the wall. As a faction headquarter, the area was designed, and in fact intended, to be completely self-sufficient. That meant that there were no gates or roads leading off from the area and the top of the wall was curved outwards so that nobody could climb up. Instead, Sam and George had to wait as the others found a rope and dropped it over the side to them. Sam went up first, and then George. As the rope was pulled back up by Eduardo, Sam let out a sigh. The corpse of the bear was visible from where they were, and if it was not dealt with, then it would attract scavengers. I think it's time to buy some gates, Sam said as they descended the stairs. Everyone else was in agreement, and as they walked back, they debated on where the best place to put them was. Eventually, they reached a consensus, which was that four gates, in a cardinal point orientation, would be best. One in the north, one in the south, one in the east and one in the west. They walked into the city hall, and Sam made his way up to the war room. It was easier to get there than to the metropolis core, and he soon entered the defense's menu. Scrolling down, he saw that there was a secondary menu now that opened up next to the walls. G-Rank Concrete Walls Modifications 
plus 1 foot of height, 10, 0, 0, 0, credits per 1,000 feet of length, plus 1 foot of width, 10, 0, 0, 0, credits per 100 feet of length, gates, 25, 0, 0, 0, credits per gate, improved battlements, 25, 0, 0, 0, credits per 100 feet of length, water moat, 35, 0, 0, 0, credits per 1,000 feet of length, Lava Moat, 500, 000, 000, 000, credits per 1,000 feet of length. All of the options were interesting, if quite expensive. What Sam was here for however, was the gates, so he quickly purchased them, inputting where he wanted them to be. There were a few flashes of light from the walls, and then everything went silent again. It was done. Sam left the city hall, and ran off, to survey the new gates. The rest of the captains all remained behind, to discuss the running of the faction over the next few days. Sam had learned that even though he was the faction leader, it was actually the captains who got most of the planning and organization done. He was supposed to be the last resort of the faction, someone who would come to the defense of the faction if it was in danger. As such, he was expected to strive to better himself as much as possible, and it was pretty hard to level up if you were stuck around a table for most of the day. In fact, Jeffrey had told him that most faction leaders did not even stay with their factions most of the time, instead going off to explore the multiverse in order to level up. That was off-limits for Sam, but he could still level up on Earth. He reached the wall a bit later, and made his way towards the closest gate. It was a grand affair, built out of white marble and solid-looking iron. There was a small portcullis on it to see who was attempting to enter and multiple iron bars crisscrossing the structure in order to keep it secure. Sam reached out and tried to pull on one of the bars. It did not budge an inch. Satisfied that it was secure, Sam took one step back and opened it with his will. The gate was keyed to him as the leader of the faction, and he could control it with his mind. It slid up slowly and he heard a cry of alarm from the top of the wall. A man looked down, with his sword at the ready, and then saw Sam. Sorry, faction leader, I thought that you were an intruder. No worries. I'm glad to see that you are being vigilant, Sam replied. The other man smiled and withdrew his head, returning to his post. As Sam exited the compound, he took a deep breath. It was time to prepare for the quest that would be starting soon. He picked a random direction and began running. He could see for miles around, the trees quite sparse in this region of the expansive forest, and what he saw did not engender any sort of happiness. Most of the ground was a blasted wasteland of scraggly bushes and scorched earth. The body parts of innumerable monsters littered the ground, and a few disconcertingly humanoid figures. They were most likely only gremlins, but it was still disturbing nonetheless. What was for certain was that there was nothing to fight around here. The killers of these creatures had since long disappeared, and Sam would have to go further afield to find them. The growling of his stomach reminded him that he needed food, as he had not eaten in days, but it was not a pressing need. He then remembered that not everybody had his high level of physicality back in the faction headquarters, but he trusted his captains to build the necessary infrastructure for farming. It should not cost that much, and if they did not use their funds to buy one, which he was sure they would, then there would be a few words had in private, perhaps punctuated with something a bit more physical. Sam was confident that he would be able to find something to eat within the next few days, and he did not turn back. He had about four days to explore, two to go out, and two to come back. He wanted to return with enough time to adequately prepare for the beginning of the next part of the quest, and he was going to make sure that he packed this time with as much value as possible. Firstly, after reaching a decent distance from the compound, it was time to check his new gains from his recent level up as well as his new skill. He decided to start with the skill, as it would only require him to look at it rather than interact with it like his stat sheet would do. You have gained the Tao skill, Girdings of the Arbiter, Mythical, in combining the stalwart energy of Earth and the wild but also virtuous energy of your Tao, you have created a powerful new ability. The power of earth allows for the manual control of your body, taking it to heights beyond what you would normally be able to. The power of your Tao allows for the preservation of your body under the stress of using such a powerful ability. 
As earth and justice never falter in their endless cycle, neither will you. Chapter 125 It was exactly what Sam had expected. A powerful, but not very flashy skill. He closed the notification and then opened his stat sheet. Sam Atlas. Human. Mortal Tear. G Rank. Class, Dow Visionary. Level 36. Three free stat points. Sam's stats were coming along nicely, and he was approaching 1,000 in each of his resources. His new title had increased his stat multiplier to almost 50% more than he would have normally. It didn't seem that impressive on paper, but that meant that he was one and a half times stronger than someone of the same level as him, but with no multipliers. What he did with his stat points was what would determine what happened to him in the future, and he was determined to choose well. The number of levels within the rest of G rank would get him enough stat points to cross the thresholds for all of his stats. Sam did not know why, but he had a strange desire to do so. If that was to work however, he would need to maximize his stat multiplier, which meant applying stat points in chunks rather than one at a time. The only real choice that he had was whether to increase dexterity or resilience. A small change to either stat would not matter that much, so he decided to metaphorically flip a coin on it. Closing his eyes, Sam sent a message to Rax. He would invest the points into dexterity if the herpetipede answered within five seconds and three into resilience if it took him more than five, but less than ten. If neither of those were fulfilled, he would just pick for himself. Sam? Hello? Rax answered six seconds later. Resilience it is then, I guess. What? Never mind. Nice to talk to you, Rax, but I need to get going now, Sam said, feeling a little bit guilty that he could not spare more time for the lizard. He ended the connection after he was sure that the herpetipede had heard him, and then allocated his stat points. A faint buzzing sensation briefly crossed his body, but that was it. With his stat points invested, it was time for him to start his journey. Three hours later, Sam had entered the more intact area of the woods again. This section was heavily forested, with tall evergreens coexisting with short and stout oaks. The trees looked a little bit different than normal and Sam frowned as he took in the knot in the side of a nearby birch. It almost looked like a closed eye, and as he neared it, it opened, revealing that it was in fact an eye. An ear-splitting scream erupted from the tree, and all around him hundreds of eyes opened. They did not seem like they could do anything but scream, but perhaps it was what they could summon that would be the problem. He could hear a faint crashing noise in the distance, and it was getting steadily louder as time passed. Sam started running towards a nearby clearing. If he was going to have to fight some sort of tree monster, he wanted some space to do it in. A shadow loomed large over the clearing, and he turned around to see a grotesque amalgamation of flesh and wood peering down at him from its lofty perch upon the top of a hundred-foot tree. For roots protruded from each side of the tree's base, and they each ended in hooked claws that dug into the ground, supporting its multi-ton weight. Upon catching sight of Sam, it roared and launched a barrage of wood spikes at him from its mouth. They were all tipped with poison, and where they landed was perforated with sharp-tipped vines. Getting hit by one of those would be extremely painful. Sam winced as he imagined being torn apart by a writhing next of vines that had formed within him. He did not bother analyzing the monster, knowing enough about monster power to know that this was near the top of G rank. It would be a very hard fight, but now that he had seen a part of its moveset, it would be a bit easier. Its movements were slow, and its attacks were not that powerful, meaning that it likely had a lot of health and defense. It was also probably the reason why he had not encountered any other monsters in this area. They were all already dead, killed by this thing. He zigzagged across the forest floor, dodging more barges of spikes. As he neared the base of the monster, it lifted one of its root legs, and stomped down where Sam had been a second ago. The ground shook, but Sam was able to keep his balance. Sam jumped up onto the root as it came around for another pass, and he whirled his mace around before sending it crashing into the monster. This was more to test its strength than anything else, and what he found was disheartening. 
Only a small piece of bark was chipped off by the attack, and a small amount of sap oozed out of the hole. The tree made a noise that almost sounded like mocking laughter, and it vibrated rapidly, trying to shake him off. Sam was getting tired of the lack of humanoid enemies of sufficient skill to let him use the full repertoire of his weapon style. His weapon mastery was stagnating now, as there were no opportunities in which he could use it to the fullest. Sam clambered further up the monster's body, using its serrated bark as hand holds for himself. Soon he had reached its head, and he drew his mace back to strike. The monster chittered and then blasted a wave of green energy out of its mouth towards Sam. He raised his hand to protect himself, but it did him no good. His entire body started to contort and swell, the natural limiters on the mitosis of his cells having been removed. He was racked with what was essentially a supercharged tumor, and he fell backwards off of the monster. Sam pushed his elemental energy and Tao energy through his body as he fell, and he succeeded in stemming the flow of the contagion a bit. Sam crashed into the ground a moment later, groaning as his bones creaked. Thankfully none of them were broken, but it was a close thing. He should have gone all out from the beginning, and he was going to do so now. One last surge of power forced the corrupting energy of the monster out of his body, and he rose to his feet, starting to merge his Tao and Earth energy into the form of his girdings of the Arbiter skill. Sam pushed himself to his feet with his willpower, and faced down the tree, an imperious glare on his face. He flicked his mace to the side, and smiled. You've had a good run, but it's about time to get the chop, he said. Chapter 126 The tree roared, apparently getting the threat for what it actually meant. Now that he had seen its magic, he inferred that it was using some sort of elemental power, perhaps that of life. If there were people who could use the power of death, then it made sense that there was an opposing element to it. In addition, he could not think of anything else that could create instant metastasis like that attack had. He could not succumb to another however. Sam did not try to climb the tree again, instead gathering his Tao energy into his mace for a single devastating strike to one of its legs. If he got rid of two legs on the same side of the tree, then it would be unable to balance. With a splintering crack, he slammed his mace home into the base of a root, tearing off a chunk of wood. Thick green veins ran through the flesh underneath, and sticky sap, like blood, oozed out. The monster let out a cry of pain that sounded like the creaking of branches in the wind. It shot another barrage of spikes at Sam, but he used the shelter of its leg to block it. As he moved, he grunted in pain as his body told him that it was not happy with the abuse that he had been putting it through. He had been able to stop the spread of the cancer, but he had not reversed the damage that it had done. Using girdings of the arbiter was just adding insult to injury. He pushed past the pain, and swung his mace again, using another chunk of his remaining Tao energy. Soon, he would have to switch to using his elemental energy, which he suspected would not work as well against a creature that was part tree. The third strike made the leg crack down the middle, and the tree groaned as one final unenhanced strike broke it in two. There was only one leg left to go. The monster was not going to go quietly into that good night however, and it expelled a thick green mist from its underbelly dousing Sam in whatever it was. His skin started to sizzle, and he watched as pustules and oozing wounds spread across his body. The tree was using the power of life magic to supercharge the microbes and viruses that were naturally on Sam, making them powerful enough to both instantly work, and to get past his durability. This was just something that he was going to have to deal with, as it was not an intrusion of Tao or elemental energy. Luckily, it was more distracting than actually dangerous, and after working past the revulsion that he felt, Sam went back to work. He used half of his remaining Tao energy to blast a large piece of wood off of the nearest leg, and two more strikes shattered the limb. There was an ominous creaking noise, and the tree started to fall. With Sam standing directly underneath it. He pushed his enhancement skill to the limit, managing to shoot himself out of underneath the monster, just in time. He spat up a wad of congealed blood from overtaxing himself so much, but it was worth it. The tree landed heavily, knocking down other trees and tearing open its fleshy parts on the forest around them. 
Sam rested for a moment, trying to reclaim enough energy to finish the monster off, and after a few minutes he was ready. The tree struggled to get to its feet, but it was completely helpless. Sam made his way towards its head, and looked into its glassy green eyes. There was a spark of sapience in there that made Sam almost regret what he was about to do, but sapience was not an indicator of virtue, indeed the greatest monsters in existence were among those possessing it. Instead, he gave it the honor of finishing it with one attack. Pushing all of the energy that he could muster into his mace, he brought it down with the force of a falling star, crushing the monster's head into paste. A rush of essence entered him, pushing him up another level. You have killed a juvenile arboreal defender. You have leveled up. It must have been weaker than the bear had been, seeing as he had only gotten a single level despite not having to share the essence, but every bit of power that he could get was welcome. Sam quickly opened his status screen and allocated his points into resilience again, taking a moment to look at the new numbers. There would be a lot of this over the next few days it seemed. Level 37. Sam closed his status and smiled at how well his stats were progressing. He was getting closer and closer to the last two thresholds. The vague feeling that he should try to get the thresholds was getting stronger the closer that he was to them, and he was not going to deny them. It would give him great versatility, and it would give him more power overall than if he had dumped his stats all in one stat. Now that he had cleared out the main monster in that area, it was time to find something to eat. Luckily it seemed that his body did not need more food to support itself, as he had feared, so a simple meal of roasted rabbit sated his hunger. It was not roasted very well, with only access to mana the rabbit was more seared than roasted, but it was still edible. The rabbit had been curiously large, which could be chalked up to the fact that it had leveled up, although why it had, Sam had no idea. For that rabbit to both have survived the initial monster infestation, and for it to have survived so long, just for it to die to sate Sam's hunger, was quite ironic. Sam tossed the bones into the woods, and he went on his way. There were no more monsters for hours, and he sunk into a semi-meditative state in which he continued to ponder his Tao. Progress was a lot slower than it had been before, because he had a fragment level down now, but every little bit counted. Instead, he used it as a way to kill time, while nominally gaining something out of it. Being away from the Tao tree was severely hurting his contemplation speed, and that was considering the fact that he had multiple bonuses already. How anyone else managed to gain a Tao and upgrade it to a decent level was beyond Sam. Although his viewpoint was a bit truncated, he supposed, because he was counting away the years as if the hundred-year deadline would be the end of his life. Sam snapped out of his meditation as he heard a stick crack near him. It was getting close to night time, and although his vision was a lot better now, it was nowhere near enough to have full night vision. It was between that of a human and an eagle, enough to be considered superhuman, but barely so. As he looked out into the encroaching darkness, he saw a small speck of red light hovering off the ground. It drifted between the trees, and Sam started to wander near it without knowing why. It flew off, and he followed it, believing that there was something important that it was leading him to. There was a faint sense of unease that was getting stronger by the minute, and suddenly all of his senses screamed at him to stop. With a titanic effort of will, Sam forced his legs to stop moving. There was a gigantic canyon in front of him, and if he had kept going, then he would have fallen in. The ball of light pulsed a deeper shade of red, and then sped off, having given up on Sam. He looked down into the canyon and could not see the bottom. It extended for miles ahead of him, and he could barely see the other side. This was most definitely not a natural thing, as if something like this had been here before the initialization, then he would have known about it. It was probably a result of the expansion of the planet that Jeffrey had told him about. He looked around, but there was no way past the canyon to get to the other side. In fact, the subtle curve of the chasm made it seem like it ringed all the way around their faction headquarters. It was a very gradual ring, which meant that it probably extended for hundreds of miles, if not more, but it still was an obstacle to his path. A faint heat drifted up from the bottom of the canyon, and he looked down at the faint red haze at the bottom. It seemed that it extended all the way down to a lava deposit, which meant that the canyon was even larger than he had expected 
unless the crust of the earth had not expanded with the rest of the planet. In any case, there was no way that he was going to get across that gulf in any reasonable amount of time. The only thing that he could think of was flying over with his enhancement skill, which would use thousands of times more mana than he had, as well as probably tearing apart his body before he had gone ten feet. No, he would have to limit his monster hunting to within the bounds of the canyon. Chapter 127 Sam turned around, giving the canyon one last look as he walked away. He would be returning to it eventually. Considering that the quest that he had been given implied that the seven seals were located in the countries that their myths originated from, it would be hard to get to, say, Europe with this canyon in the way. There must be a way out, and Sam would have to find it. Unless the system just didn't care about screwing him over. That was a distinct possibility. After all, he had chosen the place to set up the faction, and the system could easily defer responsibility. For now, it was in his interest to grow as powerful as possible. Sam wandered through the woods, looking for more monsters to fight. What would have been very welcome at that moment would have been a dungeon, but he had already cleared one of those in this area, which meant that statistically there were no others around here. In addition, there was a dearth of monsters available, with a few strong ones having cleared out all the weak ones. It took a while for him to find another quarry, and as he hunted for monsters, he continued to work on his Tao as he walked. The rhythmic tread of his footsteps helped to ground himself in his meditation, which made it so that when the first monster came into view, he almost didn't catch it. A tiny snake, colored a bright purple, hissed at him from beside a tree. Despite its diminutive appearance, it produced a strong aura of danger. As Sam started to draw his mace, the snake flashed forwards like a bullet, appearing in front of him. It sunk its teeth into his hastily raised mace, and the weapon creaked beneath the power of the bite. When the monster retreated, there were two fong marks on the previously inviolate weapon. There was no venom on it, but with a bite strength like that, there didn't need to be. If that snake latched onto him, his bones would break beneath its power. As the snake flashed forwards for a second strike, Sam centered himself and used girdings of the arbiter to force himself out of the way. He snapped his hand up towards the snake, but it was too fast and all that happened was that he skinned his hands on its scales as it passed. Sam swore and swung his mace forwards as the snake flashed in again. This time he missed, and the snake sank its teeth into his left arm. His bone cracked and almost broke, but he tore it off with his other hand. Gritting his teeth, he crushed it between his fingers. Luckily, its talents for strength and speed did not extend to its durability, and it was quickly turned to a paste. You have killed a juvenile crush viper. Sam did not level up from that, and he was starting to get a bit perturbed at how so many of these powerful creatures were only juveniles. Did that mean that the more powerful, mature, versions of these entities would be coming later? Sam was about to toss the snake to the side, but he saw something interesting. Its teeth were scintillating in the light of the sun, and they looked to be incredibly dense. Sam ripped them out of the snake, and was surprised at how heavy they were. They were both at least ten pounds in weight, and they would probably make good weapon parts. He pocketed them, and kept on searching for more monsters. The body of the snake twitched ominously behind him, but Sam did not look back, and thus missed the fact that the snake wriggled away into the undergrowth, despite being completely dead. A low noise, that almost sounded like a rumbling laugh, emanated from the earth. Sam looked down uneasily, but eventually chalked it up the trees around him or something. High up above him, a bird wheeled around, watching him intently. There was only one thing amiss. Both of its eyes were gone. The next day, Sam had killed three more of the vipers, netting himself yet another level. He had continued with his idea of dumping points into one stat over the others, bringing his resilience up to 47. One more level, and he would have yet another threshold stat. It had been a bit since he had gone through a threshold, and he was not looking forward to the experience. However, he had access to the best painkiller in the world, the promise of power. On the last viper, he had noticed something strange, which was that it had disappeared after he had killed it but he had dismissed it as a fault in his memories. That was more to convince himself that nothing uncanny was going on, 
seeing as his memory at this point was almost perfect. Sam had tested out his new durability, and it was quite satisfying to do things like jumping off of 20-foot trees, and only feeling like he had stepped out of a car. In addition, he made his hands like weapons in their own right, as he would be able to punch things without hurting himself as much. As he was getting near the top of G rank, if he was not already at it, his weapon was starting to hold him back. It felt far too light, which made it harder to control it than he was used to. It still worked fine, but it was weird to have the feeling of waving a stick around. The weapon was probably about 50 pounds in weight, which was more than a normal person could use effectively, but it would have had to be closer to 250 pounds for Sam to feel the weight now. Perhaps one of the seven seal weapons would help him out with that. Mjolnir was a hammer after all, which was something like a mace, assuming that it would actually be constructed like how he expected. A creaking noise sounded behind him, and Sam turned around sharply. There was something walking through the woods towards him, and it was large. By the noises that it was making, it was another arboreal defender. Sam readied himself for battle, but then paused as it came into view. It was the same one that he had fought earlier, and it was clearly dead. Its body was broken and was covered in sticky sap, but it moved like none of its injuries were present. Sam's hair stood up on end, and he gulped. There was something sinister, going on here. If he didn't know better, this looked like the work of a necromancer. None that he knew of were powerful enough to animate this huge monster however, or even had the power to animate any dead thing for that matter. This was something else entirely. The monster opened its mouth and let out a wheezing gasp that seemed to be in the impression of a roar. Sam frowned, and then spotted a cloud of dark particles pouring out of it. They whirled around in the air, creating a whirlwind of darkness. A spear made up of those particles streaked down towards Sam, and struck the ground next to him. Its effect was the polar opposite of the arboreal defender's previous attack, withering the life within the area, to nothing. It was still equally deadly however. The entire monster had been corrupted by death energy, which was likely how it was moving. Sam could feel something odd about its aura however, and there was a strange nugget of blazing power at the center that did not belong to the monster itself. Sam scanned the creature, and found that its suspicions were correct. Juvenile Arboreal Defender, Thrall Level 46 The new addition to its name meant that it was no longer a free monster, instead a slave to something else. Its level was still the same as it had been before, not that Sam had actually scanned it but he was getting good at estimating levels. It was a lot stronger than Sam, at least on paper, but his stat bonuses evened the gap. All that it had on him was its size and exotic abilities. Sam was not sure how exactly levels factored into the size of a monster, after all there were creatures that were just as powerful as this thing, but far smaller, but it didn't really make sense that it would be exactly the same strength as something the same level of it. That would mean that a level 1 version of this monster, while remaining the same size, would be just as weak as a level 1 human. No, there was something else at play here. Chapter 128 Sam wove around another spike, choosing not to use his enhancement skill yet. He was going to save that for when he needed it. He made his way towards the base of the undead tree, noting that strange tendrils of rotting flesh had replaced its missing roots, allowing it to stand once more. That was a curious sight, and he wondered if they were weaker than the wood had been. Well, there was only one way to find out. Sam smashed his mace into the sickeningly gray substance, and a flood of pus exploded outwards. He only missed it by a few inches, and where it landed the ground withered and sizzled away. Acid would not be a nice way to go. Sam saw that his attack, while having elicited a large reaction, had not really damaged the limb at all. He sprang back as the foot shot out, far faster now that it was no longer made out of wood. Sam was caught by the wind of its passing, but he held firm and nothing special happened. As the foot planted itself in the ground, preparing to strike again, Sam lashed out with his mace, filling it with the red-hot energy of his Tao. He emphasized the fiery aspect, causing the mace to burn with a red heat as it made contact with the disgusting appendage. The flesh was flash-fried into oblivion, and the pus dried up, before it could be expelled towards Sam. The monster roared weakly, 
and stamped down again. The fact that it couldn't feel any pain in its new legs was a major downside, and as its foot touched the ground, the leg buckled and crumbled apart, in a welter of blackened blood and bodily fluids. The defender almost toppled over, but it caught itself with its other corpse leg, the flesh being able to contort more than the wood had been. It steadied itself, and then disgorged a stream of strange creatures from underneath its body. They looked like spiders, with bodies made of wood, and legs out of the same gray flesh as their progenitor. They were far weaker than the larger monster was, and each swing of Sam's may sent them back to their maker, but there were a lot of them, and the tree monster was still, uh, undead and kicking in the background. It was not idle, and each time that Sam tried to get past the spiders, it would shoot a beam of black energy that he had to dodge. Each time that it struck a spider, the creature bulked up and became harder to kill, but if they were struck a second time, then they exploded in a shower of filth. There was a limit to the amount of energy that the monsters could hold, and it was not a lot compared to the tree lurking in the background. The creature let out a sudden roar, and it trembled. Sam sensed something shift within it, and he scanned it again. Juvenile Arboreal Defender, Thrall. Level 45. He had sensed it correct. The creature was burning essence to empower its minions, and it was slowly but steadily losing essence. Every time that it shot out a beam of darkness, it was also losing power. If it continued like this, then it would be lower level than Sam before long. The creature realized this, or perhaps its master did, and it stopped launching the attacks. Instead, it crushed its way through its spiders, and then launched itself at Sam, with its legs leading the way. Sam had never seen a tree jump before, and it was a sight that he did not wish to see again. It landed with an earth-shaking thump, and Sam was knocked off of his feet. In the moment that he was in the air, a lance of energy shot down from the arboreal defender, and drilled a hole through his chest. Sam screamed as the withering effect of the necrotic energy burned its way through him, and his health dropped dangerously. It was below half from that single attack, although that was not really an indicator of the monster's power, but rather a testament to what death energy would do to living flesh. Sam forced it out of his body with his own energy, but he was unable to completely stymie it, and it continued to burn through him with the heat of a thousand suns. All right, maybe it was a bit less than that, but it certainly felt like that was what was happening. Sam gritted his teeth and got to his feet, taking conscious control of his body with his skill. The tree monster sent down another spike of energy, but he dodged it, screaming out loud as his atrophied flesh was torn as he moved. Sam crushed his mace within his hand, feeling his finger bones creak as he locked his grip down. With a titanic roar that was far too loud to come from his small body, Sam rushed forwards, breaking his very cells apart as he ran. Leaping as high as he could go, he lifted himself even further with his skill, landing about halfway up the monster's lower half. Clambering up it like a monkey, Sam reached its head, dodging yet more blasts of energy. The wood of the tree burnt his flesh as he climbed, but compared to the searing pain within him from the necrotic beam, he barely felt it. He reached the monster's head, and struck it with an enhanced mace strike filling every atom of the weapon with his Tao and Earth energy. The strike was a truncated version of his finisher, designed to release all of its damage in one go. He was blasted off of the monster by the backlash, and smiled as he saw a huge crater form on the monster's head. As he fell down into the blackness of unconsciousness, he saw the creature topple over backwards. Sam woke to the sound of flowing water, and he stretched out idly, wincing as his body ached. The foul smell from his surroundings caused him to wake up immediately, and he retched as he saw what the sound was coming from. A thick stream of yellow filth oozed out of the corpse of the monster. It had spread across the clearing, eating away at everything in its way, and had almost reached Sam. He jumped back as a reaching tendril almost touched his foot. If he had slept for a moment more, he would have been dead. Safe from the threat, he checked his notifications. You have killed a juvenile arboreal defender thrall. You have leveled up. It was time for him to transcend the limits of his resilience and to break through the threshold. With a deep breath, he began. Sam clenched his fists as he placed the points into his resilience stat. With a sickening crack, 
his body started to tear apart at the seams. The apocalyptic, world-shattering pain began a moment later, as he saw his body dissolve into a slurry of flesh and melted bone. It swirled around in the ground, starting to condense upon itself, and streams of mana and, oddly enough, earth elemental energy raced in from outside. His flesh started to form back into a cohesive shape, and his bones followed soon after. Before long, he was back in his normal shape, with only the memory of his torment left. That had been quicker than he had expected, perhaps in a similar way to how his intelligence threshold had been eased by having already passed his wisdom threshold. He had already passed his constitution threshold, which was related to resilience. Sam opened his notifications, and read the entry. You have passed the first threshold of resilience. Resilience is a concept with many different meanings. Whether resilience of the body, mind, or soul, it is the same however. It means that one stands defiant against all who seek to oppose them, remaining strong in the face of adversity. In the more physical sense, you have formed a new body out of the pressure of your will and the use of your mana and elemental energy. In doing this, you have shown that you are not lacking in all three types of resilience. What worthier possessor of the first threshold of resilience lives than you? The answer is that there are many, and to prove yourself, you must show that your resilience stands supreme. Chapter 129 Sam could feel that his body was more durable now and more able to take the wear and tear of battle. He felt something else as well, a comforting solidity that came from his elemental energy. He had forged a deeper connection with his element by using it to upgrade his body, and it showed. You have reached 4% mastery of your meridian of earth. He had gone up an entire percentage point, despite having not contemplated his element in quite some time. Sam didn't really know how he had brought the energy of Earth into his threshold trial, but the results showed. His actual multiplier was probably higher than the additional 50% that it was supposed to be, judging by how his body felt. Sam walked over to a nearby tree and punched it full force with his hand. It shattered the wood with ease, and he didn't feel anything, save for the momentary resistance of the wood. There was no pain, only normal sensation. Sam grinned and thought of all the possibilities that this would unlock. The only thing he had left to do before reaching F rank was to reach his dexterity threshold as well. Doing so would require the deaths of many monsters, but that was fine with him. As well as that, he would have to get to the bottom of the mystery behind the undead arboreal defender. There was something evil lurking in this forest, and it was resurrecting the dead. He was watching his time carefully and he would have to start heading back to the compound soon. Sam had wanted to check on the quest anyway, and it had a handy timer on it as well. He opened up his notification log, and found the engines of the end times quest. Engines of the end times. Difficulty hesitant face. You have formed a faction and have begun to take over the surface of your planet, but there are three things that stand in your way. These are divided into the subquests below. The Seven Seals. Seven weapons of great power, based on the mythologies and legends of your world, have been created around the world. They reside in locations that match their origins. Claim all seven of them to create the greatest weapon that your planet has ever seen. The possessor of this weapon will be able to exert dominance over all others. Ultimate Goal Find all the weapons below. Mjolnir, 0 to 1. Excalibur, 0 slash 1. The Spear of Longinus, 0 to 1. The Sickle of Kronos, 0 slash 1. Sun Wukong Staff, 0 to 1. Gunnir, 0 to 1. The Thunderbolt of Zeus, 0 slash 1. The Legion. In the time since the initialization started, there has been a curious absence of anyone who has been a soldier before the system arrived. This is because of the actions of one man. General Hugo Mar chanced upon the beginning of the path to the Tao of Legion. In doing so, he laid claim to every soldier to live on the planet through a unique form of Tao resonance, subsuming them into his hive mind. They now exist as the ultimate monster of your planet, a many-headed monstrosity of fused will. This force lives only to spread itself, an anarchic terror of pure self-propagation. Ultimate goal, eradicate the Legion. Invaders from beyond the stars. 
malefactors from other universes will seek to use your universe as a source of power. You must show them the error of that desire by forcing them off your planet. Some of the alien species will be benevolent, but most will be hostile. Ultimate goal, remove any threats from other universes. Ultimate goal, complete all three quests. Rewards, planetary dominance. 85 hours 35 minutes and 29 seconds hours remaining until the quest begins. Last time, Sam had only glanced over the quest notification in order to get a better idea of them, but this time he actually studied them and began to make inferences about what he would have to do for them based on the descriptions. Firstly, he had already considered the Seven Seals quest a few times, and now that he knew of the existence of the canyon, that one would require more effort than the others. For the Legion quest, the name of the general in question, Hugo Mar, sounded Western in origin, and if he had not been taken away to the tournament, then he was likely still in wherever he had been before it had begun. Sam was hoping that he was in America, but he could easily be in Europe. As well as that, the armies were probably spread around the world too. Killing the main threat would be the wisest plan of action however. Finally, the last quest looked like something that would be resolved as it happened. He had no way to find random aliens invading the planet, and the only real option was to fight a defensive war. That involved reinforcing their base until it was utterly impregnable, and having enough power to resist the overtures of the invaders. Either they would be stratified to an appropriate rank for the planet, and they would be mostly fine, or else some random e rank alien or something would show up, and they would all be dead. Sam doubted that it would be the last one, but there was always a possibility. He walked over to the corpse of the arboreal defender, and looked it over. Sam wanted to see how exactly being raised from the dead had impacted the creature, and it was quite clear from a quick inspection. Its veins and sap were all a gray color, one that could not be described by just decay. It had been corrupted by some outside force, and Sam wanted to find it. Something that powerful would be a grievous threat in the future, if it ever decided to attack the faction. For now, it appeared to be neutral, only turning random creatures into undead. Sam left the clearing, and started hunting for more monsters again. His goal was to pass his final threshold, before he had to return to the faction headquarters. Three days and thirteen hours was not that much time, but Sam would, no had, to make it work. It was time to start working smarter, not harder. The presence of this corpse would draw in monsters, if not for food, then out of interest. It was not every day that such a titan of the forest fell after all, and the local ecosystem would be impacted by that. Other monsters would see this as an opportunity for them to rise up from their current stations, if they could leverage this to their advantage. Sam secreted himself in the top of a nearby tree, and waited patiently for his quarry to come. He was going to give it three hours, and if by then nothing came around, he would give up. Shifting to get comfortable, Sam got ready to pounce. About an hour later, the undergrowth shook, and a massive boar trundled out from behind the bushes. It was at least ten feet tall, and its hooves were coated in flames. Two curling horns crowned its head, and it snorted angrily as it plodded heavily across the ground. Each footstep left a deep and blackened dent in the ground and each snort expelled a small burst of fire. It sniffed at the air, and started to make its way over to the corpse of the arboreal defender. As it moved, it passed directly underneath Sam's tree. When it was directly below him, he made his move. Sam raised his mace above his head and packed it with power, before leaping off the branch and towards the boar. It snapped its head up, but it was too late. Sam brought the mace down on the monster's head like a wrecking ball, shattering its horns, and driving the fragments into its skull. Thick and steaming hot blood coursed out of the beast, and it roared in pain. However, it was not dead. Instead, it opened its mouth and breathed out a flamethrower-like stream of fire that blasted Sam off of its back, searing his skin. It would have done a lot worse to him if not for his recent threshold, and he was glad that he had chosen to do resilience before dexterity. He crashed into a tree, and snarled as he pushed himself off, refusing to lose any momentum to the attack. The boar stamped its foot, and a crackling fissure of molten rock raced across the ground towards Sam. He leaped to the side, 
and felt a blast of furnace-like heat strike his skin. It dried it out, but not much else. Sam smiled with a wild look on his face as he ran, and snapped his mace out to the side, in order to get the most leverage with his next attack. The boar roared out loud, its ruined horns falling off its head and clattering to the ground. With an evil glint in its eyes, it charged Sam, accelerating to speeds that far belied its size. Sam did not cower, and he met its charge with one of his own, whirling his mace around himself before battering the boar in the side of the head. The creature, all twenty feet of it, went tumbling end over end, rolling in the acidic pool left by the arboreal defender. It shrieked in agony as the liquid seared its skin away, and it raced out of the pool, snorting and pawing at the ground. That had not been what Sam had intended, but it was a welcome bonus. The boar rolled its eyes in bestial rage, and slammed its front legs into the ground. The earth shook, and a surge of molten rock exploded out of the area around it. A large clump of lava landed on Sam's arm, and he screamed as it burnt his skin and bone away. He scooped it off with his mace, and lobbed it back at the boar. Nothing happened, as it was immune to fire, but at least the momentum of the attack staggered it. Sam closed in on the boar, and carefully made his way around the piles of lava. The heat from them scorched his skin, but he ignored it. Standing in the middle of this all was the boar, grunting and groaning as it waited for Sam to advance. Sam clenched his jaw as he gripped his mace, the motion sending a spike of pain through his burned arm. He locked his grip in with girdings of the arbiter, and channeled his power into his mace, preparing to use his finisher. Breaking into a run, Sam ducked underneath the boar's fiery breath and then caught it below the jaw. Justice! The boar was tossed off its feet and into the air. Is! Sam swung his mace into the boar's stomach and lifted it up higher. Best! He leaped into the air and swatted it aside with his mace. Served! Sam landed and then jumped over to the boar's falling body. Cold! He swung his mace down into the boar, and its entire body detonated, sending it down into the ground like a meteor. Its body splattered from the impact, and Sam was showered by its boiling blood. Luckily it was just that, boiling, and his skin was easily able to withstand liquids of that temperature now. Essence poured into him, and coupled with the overflow from the arboreal defender, it was enough to push him up a level. You have killed a juvenile inferno boar. You have leveled up. Chapter 130 Sam moved over to its corpse, and tore it apart with his mace, not wanting to have to fight it again if it was resurrected like the defender had been. Sam then added his stat points, bringing up his dexterity to 37. He could feel a faint difference in his movements, and he swung his hand in front of him to test its speed. The gust of wind that it produced told him that it had indeed made a tangible difference. Sam dragged the remains of the boar over to the defender corpse, laying it to make it look like they had fought to the death. That would attract even more monsters that just the defender alone had. He climbed back up into the tree, and waited. Barely thirty minutes later, a small pack of wolves paced into the clearing. They were all individually weak, barely level thirty, but in a pack, they were strong. There were seven wolves, with one larger one leading them. That wolf was level 32, and it was clearly the pack alpha. This would make it so that he could only get one attack off on the wolves, so he would have to make it count. He decided on the alpha, not a difficult decision, and waited until it passed underneath him. It looked up into the trees, sniffing suspiciously, but then looked back down. Sam grinned and launched himself out of the tree. The wolf splattered beneath his mace, even without any sort of imbuement. The other wolves held an alarm, and Sam took another life with an overhead smash of his mace. The remaining wolves all held again, and this time, there was a different effect. A red aura surrounded them, and their movements sped up. The wolves were drawing power from each other somehow, but they were still nothing compared to Sam. He dodged to the side as the first wolf snapped its jaws at him, and reached out with his hand, grabbing onto its tail. It seemed that his expertise with blunt weapons applied to a wolf being used as a flail, and he swung it up and over towards one of the other wolves. Both wolves struck each other with a dull thud, and broke on each other like two rocks smashing into each other. 
The remaining wolves snarled and started to run. Sam shook his head and bounded forwards, smashing them into the ground. They all died a moment later, and Sam had a strange feeling. It was almost like his Tao was having a moment of ambiguity. Was it really morally right for him to be doing something like this, even to monsters? It wasn't really wrong either, seeing as monsters had no sense of justice, and thus would act in an evil manner as soon as they had the opportunity, but had these ones done that yet? It was an age-old philosophical problem. At what point did prevention of an act eclipse the probable act in evil? Countries had struggled with this, trying to eliminate crime through sharp crackdowns, before a person had really done anything wrong. It had become even worse in the Internet age, with government surveillance and other such invasions of privacy. It was a question that transcended all of those things, and still remained relevant after the apocalypse. It was one that Sam had no answer to. He shook his head and dismissed the thought. The possible good that he could do by killing a few potentially evil monsters for levels was far more than enough to offset the guilt. With his Tao appeased, Sam set up his trap again. A day, and two levels later, Sam was on the cusp of his final threshold. The only problem was that no more monsters seemed to be interested in the gore-soaked wasteland that the clearing had become. Sam was starting to become impatient, and he did something that he would later regret. He held into the sky, imbuing the cry with his Tao. Immediately, the roar of a titan answered him. The noise was so strong that it made Sam cover his ears. The ground began to rumble, and a shadow stretched over the woods. There was something coming. Something big. The noise was emanating from the canyon, and Sam saw what the source of the shadow was. A one-eyed giant, easily two or three hundred feet tall, was looking directly at him. It grinned, revealing chipped teeth, and it breathed out, wafting a malodorous stench into the forest. With three mighty leaps, it was a quarter of the way to Sam. There was no way for him to outrun the thing, so his only hope was to defeat it. He scanned it, but what he saw gave him pause. Juvenile Cyclops Level? He had never seen a question mark on his analysis skill before, which could only mean one thing. The monster was F rank. Its aura could be felt from where Sam was, but there was one grain of hope in the whole thing. It did not feel that much stronger than his own, despite belonging to a beast as intimidating as the Cyclops. Still, it was like comparing an experienced weightlifter to an elite one. Relatively they were not that different, but practically they were a world apart. The monster reached him a few moments later, and it grinned at him with an evil look in its one eye. This was most definitely a creature that had committed great sins, before. Sure of this, Sam used eyes of judgment to gain an edge against the Cyclops. It lit up with a dark energy, and Sam felt his body fill with power. The beast roared and jumped up into the air, before slamming down like a fleshy meteor. Sam leaped off the tree just in time to avoid its strike, but he was bowled over by the earthquake that soon started. The Cyclops laughed nastily and reached down with its hand to grab at Sam. Sam leaped over its ponderous strike and landed on its arm. He clambered up it, using its gigantic hairs to keep a grip. It withdrew its hand, unable to see Sam among the thick bush of hair, and it wiped its nose with it. Sam jumped off and grabbed onto its greasy hair, climbing up to the top of its head. There was a prominent bald spot there, and Sam gathered his energy before lifting his mace and bringing it down on the cyclops' head. It was like a lightning bolt had landed there, and a pillar of energy briefly lanced up into the air as his supercharged attack landed. The cyclops screamed in pain as a ten-foot crater was blasted into its cranium, and it slapped at the top of its head ineffectively. Sam was narrowly missed by one of its fingers, because he had crouched down low in its wound. The cyclops then did something unexpected. It started to glow with a yellow light, and its skin rippled as a stony layer of armor surged out of its skin. Sam was caught unawares, and he was pushed off into the air. The cyclops spotted him and it swatted Sam out of the air. Sam screamed as his bones broke and he was flattened into the ground by the attack. Coughing up blood, he rose to his feet shakily. Knowing that this would hurt, Sam grabbed a hold of his bones and torn muscles with his enhancement skill, and forced them back together. 
holding them there with his will, he created an agonizing cradle of energy that held his broken body together long enough for him to get away from the next strike. He had vastly underestimated the Cyclops, and he was now paying the price. His only chance was to attack it in the weakened area of its head, which would be hard to do with the armor in place. Sam grabbed onto its arm as it passed by, groaning as his bones were almost wrenched out of their tenuous connection. He clambered up and made his way towards the beast's shoulder. It failed to notice him, and Sam climbed up its hair again. He almost slipped halfway up, but he managed to stay connected. That alerted the Cyclops to his presence however, and Sam had to contort to avoid a poke of its rocky finger. Luckily, the monster's hair had not been calcified by its ability, otherwise he would have had no way to get up here. As it was, Sam managed to climb up to the creature's bald spot again, and he noticed that there was a significant dent there, and the stone was cracked. Sam rushed over, trying desperately to hold himself together long enough to strike, and swung his mace down into the largest crack. He wanted to save his energy for the killing blow, so this one was unenhanced. It was enough to break apart the weakened layer of stone, and it sent shards of rock into the cyclops' skull. It cried out in pain, and Sam swung again, this time imbuing it with the preliminary aspects of his finisher. His mace detonated against its head, and the cyclops let out a low groan. It fell to its knees, stunned. Sam swung in a frenzy of motion, his body filled with burning pain as his tenuously connected ligaments and bones tore apart. A minute later however, it was done. The cyclops fell over, Sam's mace buried in its brain. A rush of essence unlike anything he had ever experienced surged into him, and Sam tumbled backwards off the cyclops' head, unconscious before he even hit the ground. Notes from the author if you liked the story, please consider following, leaving a rating, slash review, or favoriting the story on Royal Road. Click on the link in the description. This would really help me out. Thanks. This would help chapters come out far quicker.